Need a lesson? If you don't have a lesson or something to write with, just raise your hand. We'll be happy to, to provide either. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Be sort of a thematic verse for what we're dealing with tonight. What we're going to eventually get around to is um, the subject of next week's lesson. That's kind of an interesting way to begin this week's lesson, but uh, we, we need to get there a certain route. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 10 and focus your attention on verse 31. It would be a great verse to memorize. Jot down on a card and memorize. It's a very simple verse, but it is such a tremendous life verse to have. Here it is, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink, what he's talking about is very mundane task, or whatever you do, that's all task. Do it all for the glory of God. See what that means in just a moment. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for what is a, a tremendous life verse actually to have, especially when it's understood in the fullness of the glory that resides in your Son, Jesus Christ. Pray, God, that you'll... Uh, Open up your word, you open up our eyes to uh, look at uh, just what a great thing we have in our possession, uh, in our homes. Um, just amazing what people who were here centuries before us have done and continue to do for us. And so, Lord, we, we ask now that you'll be pleased now to to bless us, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to, um, I want to give you a suggestion. How many of you have uh, iPhones? Just raise your hand. Okay, there is an app you can go to in iPhones, and I would highly recommend it. It's, um, I'm going to... I'm going to go to the app store to make sure I get it just right. Um, it is a free, so don't have to worry about paying anything for it. Um, let's see. Tell you what, I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> there's a there's an app, and I have to I have to get the name of it to give to y'all. I don't want to be searching it down. I thought um, I thought maybe I might be able to. No, it's just okay. Here it is. The app is entitled Jot This Down: Reformed Companion. Reformed Companion. You can get it on your app store, and what it is, Reformed Companion, what it is when you download it, it is, it is free, it has the catechisms, the creeds, the confessions, the doctrines of grace, and the five solas, all there on an app. So you can, you know, instead of having to remember to carry around a catechism or, or whatever, and it has all those things uh, right there. And I would highly recommend it. A reformed Companion. It, uh, where you can spot the app is it's kind of purple. It has sort of a king's crown on it. And uh, I'd highly recommend that. Um, you can download it here if you have, if you have Wi-Fi connection. it will be good when you get home. Be sure to, to download that. Um, probably. You can get it there? Okay. 
I, I, I couldn't speak to that, so I'm, I'm glad you can get it on Android, too. Okay, um, if you think about it, journeys always start at their end, not their beginning. Have you thought about that? Journeys always start at their end, not their beginning. Well, you may think, well, I don't know exactly how that works out. Let me just give you an example. When I stand up from the, ch from the chair in which I've been sitting, well, most of the time at night reclining, I stand up because I have some place to go. I have some task to accomplish. And if you think about it, my, my first step and every step afterwards is determined by the end that I've already decided. That end may be to get a drink of water. It may be to take the three pills that I need to take an hour and a half before I go to bed at night. Uh, it may be to grab a snack, which I do not recommend after 7 o'clock at night. Or it may be to take out the trash for the next morning, which I do recommend because our trash people come by real early. And so if I'm going to take out the trash for the next day, it's got to go out that night. But if you think about it, to go anywhere, you have to envision an end, an end point, a destination. Well, in the Bible, what we have here, and this is the first major point here, to fill in, and that's this. First major point in, in the bold green is the destiny, the end of our life's journey. The destiny, the end of our life's journey. Now, in the Bible and in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which, by the way, a catechism is just a summary of basic historical teachings of what Christians believe. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, our chief end, our ultimate purpose in life, what we have that's worth living for is actually spelled out for us. In the first three questions of the Westminster Shorter Catechism, think about that. Wow, and you see it there in that diagram. Our chief end is question and answer number one. It is clarified in scripture, notice on that diagram in question number two. And then scripture teaches two things. Think about it. All of Scripture can be divided into two parts. The things we are to believe concerning God, which is what question and answer 4 through 38 teach. And then the, other two th the second thing the Bible teaches is the duty God requires of us. That's questions number 39 through 107. I've mentioned to people a good way to do Bible study is to do this. In your journal and a piece of paper, just draw a line down the middle of the sheet on this side, say, what does this uh, verse reveal about God? And then on the other side, what does this verse tell me to do? What we are to believe concerning God, what duty God requires of us. Now, the catechism has fallen upon hard times recently, but really, how many of y'all remember learning the English alphabet with the alphabet song? You remember? How many remember... Remember the tune of the alphabet song? What is it? Twinkle, twinkle, little star. That's right. We recited the English alphabet to the tune of twinkle, twinkle, little star, A, B, C. Okay, Westminster Shorter Catechism, and the, especially the first three questions. This is our twinkle, twinkle, little star. This is our basic teaching tool to help us learn and remember the basics of our faith in a way where we can access it or we can retain it. If you can learn these first three questions of the catechism, you have your twinkle, twinkle, little star moment. Westminster Shorter Catechism is a distillation of great truths from the Bible. It orients us to know what to believe and what to do. Now, besides orienting us on what to believe and what to do, there's another use of the catechism you may not have thought about. I hadn't thought about it until I began reflecting on it, and that's this. Did you know the catechism, besides teaching us, and by the way, I commend Tammy back there, teaches the child's catechism to our children, and by the way, that way the adults learn it too, because they're having to teach it to their kids. Um, 
The catechism also builds true community. Think about that. The catechism builds true community. I remember coming across a poster years ago that was circulated in a couple of, let's just say, left-leaning churches, and it's a poster, Peanuts, Charlie Brown, hugging Snoopy, and the caption on the poster is, Hugs, not theology. Now, if, if you're in a small group, I would say, what would you do if someone walked up to you and pointed to a poster on their wall that said, hugs, not theology? How would you respond to that? Well, you know, we can't go around the room tonight, but think about how you'd respond. Well, here's one way to respond. You know, that poster does reveal a deep human longing. We all have a deep longing for community, to connect people with people. We really do want a hug. But the poster also reveals this popular notion, and it's even more popular today, that somehow theology gets in the way of community. Now, please understand this. Theology can be misused, but the misuse of a thing should not keep us from the thing. Growing up, I had a friend who took, um, who took her violin bow and whacked her brother with that violin bow because she thought her brother was being annoying. Now, that bow was not used for its intended purpose. Its intended purpose, it is an instrument of beauty And because it wasn't being used correctly, the bow broke. A violin bow is not intended to be used as a weapon, and neither is theology. Our theology actually provides the content for every relationship in our lives, including our relationship with the church. So, the question here in the double asterisk is this, and we'll begin with question answer number one. And by the way, this fall we're not going through the catechism, but we're touching on parts of the catechism and going into particular parts of Scripture that deal with certain parts of the catechism. But double asterisk question is, what is your primary purpose in life? Here's the part to fill in. We all have answers. We all have answer, answers, conscious or not, to that question. Everybody has an answer to that question. What is your primary purpose in life? I'm going to give some examples in just a moment, but let's fill out this other part here. The answer to that question, what is your primary purpose in life, will reveal what our God is. Now, what is your primary purpose in life? Think about it. For college students, it would be to graduate to pursue a lifelong career ambition. Perhaps uh, someone wants to be a meteorologist. Perhaps someone wants to be a graphic designer. Perhaps someone wants to go into law school. For me, it was, it was to teach and to be a, an announcer, to be in radio, television, and film. For a homeless family, you know, purpose is just to find the next meal. A salesman lives for the next sale. An addict lives for the next hit, the next high. Some people live to find the approval their fathers never gave them. Others live to achieve a level of respect, perhaps even renown. They want to be known. They want to make a name for themselves. Some people live to experience as much pleasure as they can before they die or acquire as much power as they can. Study was done in Washington, D.C. the other day that most people in Washington, D.C. are multimillionaires, so it's not it's not money they're after as much as it is power. So so what what drives you? Some people can't even say they just want to pursue some level of happiness. Well, whatever drives you, whatever your primary purpose is, that's your God. So that leads us to the next thing to be filled out, and that's this when our lives are shaped by the pursuit of God's glory, that's the word to fill in. When our lives are shaped by the pursuit of God's glory, this pursuit 
will set the tone for every part of our lives. Those of you who study music, perhaps some of you who studied history, remember that Johann Sebastian Bach inscribed at the bottom of many of his great musical manuscripts the initials SDG, which is Latin meaning to the glory of God alone. Sola Deo Gloria. And you know what? Sola Deo Gloria SDG should be inscribed on every burger we grill and every email we send. See, next, next line here to fill out, living for God's glory is the posture out of which we find our greatest happiness. That's it. Living for God's glory is the posture out of which we will find our greatest happiness. Now, if you would, turn over to Hebrews chapter 3. I want to show you uh, what it means to glorify God by showing you what it looks like and what it doesn't look like. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 3. We'll see how these verses tie into what I'm fixing to talk about here in just a moment. Hebrews 3, verses 3 and 4. Jesus has been found worthy of greater glory than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater glory than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but notice this, God is the builder of everything. So the greater glory goes to God. Uh, what does it mean for us to glorify God? I want to share something with y'all. This is um, from a blog that I go to every day. There's certain websites and blogs I go to every day. And this is from a guy named Tim Chalice, C-H-A-L-L-I-E-S. He has a lot of good articles. And um, he was talking about what it means to glorify God. And to explain it, this is what he said. Listen to this. Let me just read it to you. I write you today from New Zealand, where I've spent a couple of days in the shadow of Mount Cook. Mount Cook is the tallest mountain in New Zealand, its highest peak soaring to over 12,000 feet. It is as majestic a mountain as you will ever see, and for obvious reasons, a must-visit for tourists. Not surprisingly, you can't drive or walk any great distance before you spot people taking photographs of the mountain. They must often stop in the middle of the long road that leads to Mount Cook so they can take the shot we've probably all seen on Instagram, a shot in which the road serves as a line that leads the eye to focus on the mountain. Like a good tourist, I stopped and took a photo as well. As I stood in the roadway and gazed at this mountain, he puts in parentheses all the time, listening carefully for cars behind me. The thought entered my mind, there is Mount Cook in all its glory. And it is indeed glorious. It is glorious in the sense that it is beautiful. You look at this mountain, it evokes awe and wonder. It's right and good that, that, that we pause to admire this mountain. It's right and good that we wish to record the memory of this mountain with a photograph. And it's right and good that once we get home, we want to share those photographs with others so they also can admire the mountain. And it's right and good that we encourage others to see this mountain and enjoy it. Does that begin to sound a little like evangelism to you? Just a little bit? If a friend ever tells me he intends to visit New Zealand, I'll be sure to tell him, make sure you visit Mount Cook. Make sure you enjoy the majesty of that mountain. And he says, and, and this, I think, helps us understand what it is to glorify God. God is beautiful, rightly seen. God evokes awe and wonder. God is worthy of glory, as much more glory as the maker of a mountain has more glory than the mountain itself. It's from Hebrews 3, 4. It is fitting we gaze at God and admire God. It is fitting we tell others about God. This is how we glorify God, 
to see him, enjoy him, admire him, and let all of this overflow into the life, uh, all, all of this overflow into a life of worship and proclamation. We tell God, God, you are lovely and glorious, and I live to make you known. And we tell others, make sure you come to know the Lord. Make sure you enjoy the majesty of our great God. Now listen to this contrast. And Tim Chalice says, But I observed something else about the road to Mount Cook. This road is also a prime location for social media influencers. As I drove along the road, I couldn't help but notice how many people put themselves between the camera and the mountain so that the mountain was merely a prop, the backdrop for a photo that featured themselves. Often these influencers would be doing something showy or wearing something skimpy that was meant to draw the eye to themselves instead of to the mountain behind them. They made themselves the focus of the photograph rather than the mountains, than the mountain. They stole the glory of the mountain by using it to glorify themselves. And this helps us understand how we fail to glorify God. We place ourselves in the foreground. God winds up in the background. We place ourselves between others and God, so instead of gazing at him and his majesty, at him and his glory, people gaze at us instead. We do this when we perform some noble deed, and then we're discontent until others acknowledge and commend us for the deed we do. We can do this when we preach or teach the word and then wait longingly for words of praise. We can do this when we worship in such a way as to be seen rather than to remain unseen. In a hundred ways, we can rob God of his glory that is rightly his. Instead of being the leading line, the road that guides other eyes to the heart of God, we become the subject that diminishes and obscures the Lord. So, on this double asterisk, let's fill this out. It's a story he tells, and let me just kind of summarize this with this double asterisk here that you fill out. Here it is. We glorify God when we acknowledge who God is and what God has done. We glorify God when we acknowledge who God is and what God has done. Second sentence. We glorify God when we respond to who he is and what he's done, when we respond to who he is and what he's done with a life of worship and with words of proclamation. Life of worship, words of proclamation. We glorify God when we give him the prominence, the focus, the heaviness in our lives that is rightly his. So that's the destiny. To glorify God in everything. And then that destiny is clarified in Scripture, which leads us now to our second major heading, and that is the roadmap to our destiny. This will just take a, just a few minutes, because what I'd like for you to do between this week and next week is look up these Scriptures. But I want to just give you a quick list of word pictures that help us understand the place of Scripture in our lives. We won't look up these verses, but let's just say what they reveal. Hebrews 5, 12 through 14 says the word is milk. That is, it's basic nourishment. Babies need milk. They need formula if they're going to grow. We need the Bible. Next, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 and 2. The word is described not just as milk, but as food. That's how we grow strong in the faith. That's how we grow beyond being infants in Christ. Next, Jeremiah 23, 21. Fire and hammer. Fire purifies, a hammer breaks something in pieces. That's what the Word does to us. James chapter 1, verses 23 through 25. The Word is a mirror that reflects what we look like. You know, the mirror doesn't lie. We have certain ways we think we look, but we look in the mirror. 
as we have the magic mirror of mirror, mirror on the wall, we see it just like it is. Mirror reflects how we really look. Psalm 19 and Matthew 7, uh, the word is a lamp and a light. Shows us where to walk. It also shows us, shows us how to find the path that leads to life everlasting. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. The word is described as seeds that are sown. They bring forth life. Those who receive this, the seeds get life, and that life lasts forever. Ephesians chapter 5. As with physical darkness, the word shines and guides us through this world's spiritual darkness. Again, uh, same as with physical darkness, this word shines. Uh, the spiritual darkness of our world is penetrated by this world. It illuminates this world. Psalm 19, verses 9 and 10. Um, and by the way, that, um, I got that verse wrong. It's in Ephesians. I'll, I'll give you the correction later. But um, it also talks about the word being compared to water. By the way, we should be able to identify in the world of the Bible, water was precious. The hot, dry climate created the need for saving water in every possible way. God's word is like water, necessary and precious. And then Hebrews chapter 6 God's word is an anchor in the storms of life. Hope is our anchor, but what's hope based on? It's what's revealed in the Bible. So God's word is an anchor. But the most graphic image used to describe the Bible, if you'll turn just one chapter over in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4 is chapter 4, verse 12. Notice what it says. The word of God is living and active, and sharper than any double-edged sword, it pierces even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. You know, when properly understood, this image has a lot of impact. The Bible cuts deep into us. It exposes things within us things we hide from others, things we may not even want others to know about ourselves, things we may not want to know. And sharp things can scare us, you know. But yet, sharp things and skilled hands bring great blessings. How many of y'all have ever had your mother stick a pin in your finger and dig out a splinter and then pull it out with tweezers? How many of y'all ever had that at any point? In you know, hey, that didn't feel good, but it brought about healing, didn't it? Think about a skilled surgeon. That knife the surgeon uses, that scalpel, ultimately brings healing. The Bible is the word of a loving, kind, heavenly Father. Cuts designed for healing, health, and growth. I had a cousin, good old cousin Doug from Stone County, Mississippi, once told me, he said, you know, Steve, I'd just soon be without my pants than be without my Swiss Army knife. Now, if we ignore the fact that a Swiss Army knife would have no home on a man without pants, my cousin made his point. Because his Swiss Army pocket knife was so useful and so diverse that he could not imagine not having his Swiss Army knife right there in his front pocket. See, handled poorly, that knife Cousin Doug had could do him great harm. But treated with respect and kept in his pocket and used frequently, that Swiss Army knife was a gift. So we pray this evening, open my eyes that I may receive wonderful things from your word. The Bible is a book full of Beauty, truth, wisdom, challenge, heartbreak, and hope. But the psalmist, we pray with God that he would teach us wonderful things from his word. Even those things that make us bleed when we first encounter them. Now what we're going to do beginning next week, 
Because remember, the, Bible, the catechism teaches first what we're to believe concerning God and then what duty God requires of us. That incredible definition of God, by the way, we're not going to break down the definition of God in the catechism, but there's, it's a very interesting how that, you know, you know the one you learn, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. That definition you learned actually came from an incident that happened in history. But then what we're going to do, we're going to go to one of the best passages in the Bible we can go to. And for the next four weeks, we're going to learn some basic truths about the most important thing that can be said about us. Think about that for a moment. What is the most important thing that can be said about us? What is it? We'll find out next week. We'll begin looking at the most important thing that can be said about us. Let's pray. Lord, we all have an end in mind in our life's journey. And we really don't take a step except with that end in mind. But is our destiny, the end of our life's journey, that of glorifying God and enjoying Him forever? And Lord, when we have this map in our hands that shows us how to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, do we take advantage of that? Lord, we pray that you would be the focus of our lives. We would hold you in awe, that we would be moved by you. We would be struck with your beauty. Lord, we also pray that we would not be people that use you for a backdrop. We do not want to get in the way of glorifying you. Please don't let us come between you and the world. Let us be roads leading to and showing others your glory. Or we look forward to our time together in your word uh, this fall. We pray, God, it would be a, a good and rich time of growth for us. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.